For the most part, man pursues life on his own, probably not because he particularly hates God or is consciously trying to ignore or avoid God, but perhaps because God just doesn't seem to be that near, or, for that matter, to be a particularly practical option when it comes to finding one's way through life. But what if there really is a God, and what if He really does want to know us and be connected to us in a real and practical and lasting way? Could it be that we are missing out on a better, richer, more joy-filled kind of life? According to the Gospel of John, into this world, where man pursues life on his own, God sent a light. God sent His only Son, Jesus, into the world. Jesus spoke His Father's words. He did His Father's works, the miracles, turned water into wine, healed the sick, fed the hungry, walked on water, even raised the dead. He spent time with, and ate with, and laughed with, and mourned with all kinds of people, even the people whom the religious authorities of that day considered shameful people, scandalous people, sinful people. But Jesus loved these people, and they loved him. And by his life and words and works, Jesus revealed the greatness of his heavenly Father. He showed man what God is really like, that he is like a good father who loves all of his children dearly. Jesus not only revealed his heavenly Father, but also claimed to be one with his heavenly Father. And over time, the hearts of many people were changed. Many were realizing that Jesus must have indeed been sent by God, how else could these miracles have happened? And the way he speaks, no one ever spoke like this man. Where did he get these teachings? But the religious leaders of that day opposed Jesus. They had him arrested and handed him over to governmental authorities to be shamefully treated, to be beaten, and to be mocked by dressing him in a royal robe and forcing a crown of thorns onto his head. Finally, they had Jesus hung on a cross to die a slow and painful death. But on the third day after this crucifixion, Jesus, not being just an ordinary man, rose from the dead and was seen by his followers, giving them the ultimate verification that he was who he claimed to be, the Son of God. Later he ascended from the earth to be with his heavenly Father. One famous verse summarizes God's gift to man this way. For God so loved the world. God loves his children. He knows and cares about each one of us. He knows our names. From the very beginning, he wanted each of us to have the extraordinary life of living in close connection with God. But man's wrongdoing, his sin, causes a separation between a God who is perfect and pure in his goodness and a sin-stained man. Even at our very best, following the best philosophies, following the highest moral teachings, performing the greatest works of kindness, we cannot make ourselves perfect and pure in goodness. We all fall short. We all do at least some things that we know are wrong. Because God is 100% pure in goodness, and since he is not willing to compromise on who he is, God will not embrace man and his sin, even when it involves what we would consider to be the smallest of sins. To do so would mean that God would no longer be pure in goodness. This doesn't mean that God loves us any less, but that we can't live in the kind of close connection with God that he always intended for us. When my wife and I go out to dinner, even though she loves cucumbers, she will not accept cucumbers for my salad because they have the wrong kind of dressing on them. Even if I try to thoroughly clean them off, she won't accept them because she claims that she can still taste the dressing. In a similar way, no matter how much God loves us, he will not accept us into connection with himself because we carry with us the taste of our sin, a taste that may not be repugnant to you and me, but is repugnant to someone who is completely pure in goodness. So our wrongdoing, our sin, prevents us from living in close connection with God, from having that extraordinary life that God wanted for all of his children. Fortunately, God had a plan to deal with our sin. That he gave his only son. So rather than leave us alone to face the rightful punishment of our sin, God made another way. He gave us his only son. Jesus was the costly gift that God himself gave to take away man's sin. Though Jesus had no sin of his own, he took upon himself man's wrongdoing, man's sin, and suffered in our place the rightful punishment for our sin on the cross. That whoever believes in him. God's gift is available to anyone, whoever, regardless of where we've been or what we've done. It doesn't depend on whether we've been good enough, 
because no one ever has been good enough to deserve this gift. It's a gift. It can't be earned, and it's available to anyone, Jesus once said. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. But a gift is meant to be accepted. After all, what good is a gift if it never gets accepted, opened, and put into use? Not much good at all. And God's gift is accepted by believing in Jesus. Now, real believing is not just a matter of the mind, mental acceptance. It's also a matter of the heart, trusting in and relying on. Many people might agree that riding a scary roller coaster would be safe and fun. But some of us won't actually ride it because we really don't trust it. We're not ready to rely on it. We may say that we trust it, but when it comes to getting in and pulling down on the safety bar, it doesn't happen, and we miss out on the thrill of the ride. In the same way, believing in Jesus is not just mentally understanding that Jesus died for our sin so that we could live in close connection with God. It's also about trusting that if I ask Jesus, if I try to follow him, that Jesus can make this happen for me. These things take trust. They may seem scary, but how else can we experience the thrill of life live close to God if we're not willing to take the chance and trust Him? So whoever admits his own sin before God, who trusts in his heart that God has made a way for him to be clean because of what Jesus did for him on the cross, and who sets his heart to actually follow Jesus, that person is made clean. His sin is taken away and paid for on the cross. So when God looked at Jesus on the cross, he saw the believer's sin. But when God looks at the believer, he sees the cleanness, the beauty, the goodness of his own son. Should not perish, but have eternal life. When the believer is freed from his sins, he is not only freed from something, the rightful punishment for his sins, but he is also freed to something else, to be alive, not just now, but for eternity. Now that sin no longer separates him from God, he is free to be in the presence of a God perfect and pure in his love and goodness, to be connected to God, to be part of God's family. And all calls for shame and guilt and embarrassment before God has been completely and forever removed. God sees only the beauty of his own much-loved child and envelops him or her in the arms of his loving presence. When I asked Jesus to take away my sin and come into my heart and be my Lord, he did. I asked for the presence of his Holy Spirit, even though I didn't know who the Holy Spirit was, and he answered this prayer in a surprising and real way. If I had it to do all over again, I can't think of anything that I would not trade to know him in this way. He is real. His presence is discernible, almost tangible. Ask for his presence in your life, and as you put Jesus first, others second, and yourself third, I believe that you will experience the truth of his presence in your life.